Five years ago, I read an article on the internet uh, where it said, a ball this size of thorium can supply you with all your energy for the rest of your life. And I thought, <coughs> that can't be true. I don't believe that for one second. A ball this small, how can that happen? Uh, then it, it also said in that article that there's enough thorium in this world in every country on this planet to supply the citizens of that planet with thorium energy for a thousand years. And then it said that thorium cost almost nothing. A ball like this would cost less than a hundred dollars. I thought, ah, this is crazy. This is some internet crazy news. I don't believe that. And I put it to the side and I went on with my life. Um, now I'm the kind of guy who reads a lot of uh, tech news. And then over the next six, 12 months, it, it kept on popping up this thorium energy thing. I was like, what is this? And then I read a few more of those articles. And when I've read maybe the fifth one, I, I thought, ah, I'm an engineer, I've got to go home and calculate, is it really true that there's all this energy in this ball? And um, so thorium is an element in the periodic table, so I looked it up on Wikipedia for all the numbers, and it took me less than 15 minutes to calculate. And in fact, it is true. And I checked my calculations several times because, ah, uh, but it is true. There's all the energy you need, not just for electrical power, but for everything, you know, heating your food. Um, building your houses, building roads and schools and hospitals and um, recycling and airplanes and gasoline for your car, everything for your whole life for a hundred years. That's quite amazing. Um, and then I thought, I'm going to get me some of that thorium. So I went on the internet, I, where, can I, where can I buy this? Where can I buy this? And I couldn't, I couldn't find places. Well, I found some places where you can buy small amounts for, for scientif uh, scientific experiments, but they were a little bit expensive. And, and then I've I found out, okay, you cannot buy it, but later I found out it's because there is no demand, so there's no supply, and then there's a second problem, thorium is slightly radioactive, so uh, there are some regulations, you, you can just, n not just be allowed to buy it in the <coughs> local shop. Um, but, uh, but I also found out through this uh, research that it is actually true that there's lots of thorium in the world, and we already know how to mine it. We have been mining it in the past, and we know the process how to uh, extract the material once we have mined it out of the ground. Um, and it's not very expensive to do that process. And it is true that it is in every country. In fact, when people are mining for other materials like uranium or rare earth metals for, you know, you need for your iPhone and windmills and whatever, uh, then we get a lot of thorium out of the ground. But since there's not a market for it, we don't want to refine it, so we just put it back in the ground. So, um, okay. So I thought, mm, what, what's, the, what's the problem then? Why are we not using it? And, and then I thought, ah, now I know why we're not using it. It's because that machine you need to convert this ball into energy is like super duper difficult to make. It's, you know, they've probably been trying for many decades and spent billions of dollars and it just, they, did, they don't even know how to make it and it's something like even worse than fusion. Um, but at that time I had, I had found some forums on the internet where I was chatting with people and they seemed to know quite a bit about this form energy. So at that point I realized it's, it's not just a crazy story on the internet. So I asked them, you know, how many 200 years is it going to take before we can build a machine like that? And then the guy on the other end, end said, no, but wait, we already built one. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, the, the, the first one, it only took a small team of people, like a few years to build it and a small budget, and it worked the first time they started up. I was like, is this true? Uh, and it turned out, yeah, it was true. It was a no crit that they built the one. And, um, and then from that, I kind of got hooked on thorium energy, and I, I wanted to figure out why we're not using it. Um, and I've spent a, quite a couple of years now to figure that out. And I, I, I kind of got the understanding finally that it's, it's because it's not a technical problem. It's a political and a, a human problem. And we're not really good at solving those kind, of, those kind of problems, except if we have an enemy. But we don't seem to have a strong enough enemy that we can get together and, and really use this. Um, then I also want to show this because, so why does a guy like me spend a lot of my free time, basically all my free time and a lot of, well, also all my free money on a project like this? It seems a little bit crazy, but for me, I find the explanation in this graph. So the social progress index is a number that the UN uses to calculate or, or uh, range different countries, how well they are doing in, uh, in prosperity. And the, the social progress index is made up uh, by a lot of different numbers, uh, carefully calculated and assembled by uh, statisticians around the world, something like child mortality, um, life expectancy, 
access to schools, access to health care, um, pollution levels, um, equal rights for men and women, and, and many, many of these things that we normally say, this is, this is something you want in a prosperous society. So th those numbers are listed up the uh, y-axis. And then out the x-axis is the amount of energy uh, <coughs> that is available per capita in those same countries. And it's really important to note that the x-axis is logarithmics. This means that uh, if you're one of the countries in the lower end, like Yemen or Bangladesh, and you want your society to be as prosperous as Scandinavian countries, then it's not enough to double your energy or make 10 times as much energy. You need to make 20 or 30 times more energy for all the people in your country in order to reach that prosperity level. And I think that, that really is something significant that we have to look at. And the next thing is that there's never been a case in the world where any, any of these countries have been able to go very far away from that blue line. And that means that this is empirical evidence that if you want a prosperous society, you need lots of energy. And nobody, no matter what your politicians are going to tell you and promise you, you know, rules and regulations will not give you prosperity. That's not, it, it cannot happen. You need energy. And um, so right now we're like 2 billion people up in the right-hand corner that have a nice <coughs> life. And then there's 5 billion people uh, further down the graph. And of course those 5 billion people would also like to have the same kind of lives as we have, prosperity and uh, stuff. Um, but... Uh, I mean, we're going to see conflicts and wars and migrations and refugees and all those problems until we solve that problem. So this is like, this is the main problem to solve if you want to solve all the other problems that politicians normally talk about. Um, and when I kind of realized that, I thought, this is a problem worth spending time on and trying to solve. I know that I cannot solve it alone. But the great thing about Thorium Energy is that there is a global community of people and it's growing all the time. And I feel I can do my little bit to help, help it, the whole thing along. Um, so, so that's the task uh, we had at, at hand. And now we want to look at what are the tools we have available. Um, so there's all kinds of different um, energy sources available. And of course we all know that eventually we'll run out of oil and gas. And like what has already been mentioned, Uranium-235 is this tiny small percent of uranium and eventually we would also run out of that if we were only using that. There's a lot of coal in the world so we could continue to burn that for many 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 years but it's it's really dirty so we it would be best if we could avoid that. Then of course there's a uh, thorium the big green uh, red one in the background and just from the thorium we already know where it is in which mines and we know that it's easy to extract it with a chemical processes, there's enough thorium for a thousand years of the current energy uh, supply, <coughs> global energy supply. Of course, there's also the renewables, um, and the really big one in renewal, renewable is, of course, the sun. And it would be beautiful if we could use the sun, right? Um, so it's a little overstated. So this graph is something that is on the internet. A little bit overstated with solar, because this is all the solar that hits the continent of this planet. But of course, you know, solar cells are not 100% efficient, and there's clouds sometimes, and then we cannot cover the whole continent. We, we need place for, for uh, growing food and place for wildlife and stuff. So in reality, it's probably way less than 10% of this we can spend. But even, even that would be more than enough, right? So, so if we could use solar, it would be nice. Um, so this graph is, um, is something that comes out every year. It's calculated by some of the leading experts in the energy sector, and they're trying to figure out <coughs> what should we invest in in the next uh, 20 years. And, um, and there are many people who supply data for these graphs. And, and they factor in all the different, uh, different technologies. Um, and you can see from this that in the next 20 years, they don't expect to get us not even a doubling of energy, just a little bit like maybe 30% extra energy. Um, so, so all those 5 billion people will, in that same time, maybe grow to 8 billion. So there's still going to be 5 billion people in 2035 20, that, that live lives where they don't have enough energy. And I'm thinking, you know, can we do something about that? Can we do it a little bit better? Um, and of course, what really worries me or irritates me is that this, this is the new uh, amount of energy that 
is added every year, and, and then they have kind of changed it for every 10 years. Um, and we see that they want to reduce the amount of coal, uh, coal. That's good. We all like that. And they also want to increase the amount of renewables. We also like that. And then oil is probably going to reduce, and, um, and then gas is going to stay the same. But I'm like, can't we do something better, like expand nuclear maybe, or even more renewable? Uh, and this is basically what I've been asked to talk about today. So I would really like to see the world that we give to our next generations is something like this, where on top of what they already predict we are going to build of new energy sources, we will add an additional 200 gigawatt electric per year. And that is a huge challenge. That is something, if we can solve that, I mean, that would be really awesome. Uh, but it's a huge challenge, but hey, I like huge challenges, so why not look at the possibilities? Uh, um, but in order to understand that, we have to look at what is the global energy made up of today? So, of course, it's mostly um, fossil fuels. We all know that. Then there's a little bit of re renewable, though this number is a little bit old, so now it's more than 20%. Uh, and if we look at the renewables, most of the renewables, you know, more than 60% of the renew renewables are burning of wood and straw and stuff like that. And it's not easy to expand because we cannot just make a lot more wood or a lot more straw. Uh, there's a limited area. Um, so that's probably not going to expand very much. Then, of course, we can expand wind and solar, and we all, all hope that's going to happen, but there are challenges in doing that. Uh, and right now, it's about wind and solar is about 1% of the global uh, energy worldwide. Uh, so to think that we can get that up to, I don't know, 10 or 20% is like, it seems really, really difficult. Um, but I admire that some people are trying it, it's the same thing that I'm trying to do something really difficult. Uh, they're also trying to do that. So I admire their, their, um, uh, the job they do. And then there's the joke of nuclear energy. Today it's 2.5% uh, or something. Um, maybe we could scale that. And from my point of view, I don't think we can scale the old type of nuclear reactors to 10% you know, if you wanted to. But I think with thorium energy, there is actually a chance that we can scale really, really fast. Um, OK, let me go back and talk a little bit about uh, wind and solar, because uh, a lot of people think that it has unlimited potentials. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that it's, it's doomed, but uh, I want people to be uh, realistic about it. Um, so the, this is one of the great graphs, right? It shows that the price has been coming down to almost nothing. At, and now, in the last five years, we've been building a lot of solar capacity. And just in 2015, we built we added 10 gigawatt electric to the global network. And this is really great. I mean, this is good news. And if we can keep on going at that rate or even increase it, it's, it's a really good thing. But still, it won't bring us like an additional 200 gigawatts. Um, but it, it's, it's good news in, gen in general. Um, now, we are from a country with a lot of uh, wind energy. Uh, so I also want to look at how does, how does that whole thing with wind energy work? And the good news from, uh, from last year is that now there are many days where we can supply 100% of the electricity we use in this country from wind energy alone. Uh, I should explain a little bit about this graph. So the red curve is the amount of energy we need as consumers. It's, this is over two weeks. And you see every night at, uh, at 6 o'clock there's a peak where we cook the dinner or something. <laughs> um, and then every time there's white space below the red line, it means that we're importing energy. And every time there's gray or blue above the red line, it means we're exporting energy to mainly to uh, Norway and Sweden. And then there are two green curves here. It's because we have two price sectors in Denmark for the spot market price. And, and that shows the, the market price of electricity. Uh, that's not the whole price, but I'll get back to that. And you see, as soon as there's 100% uh, electricity for uh, wind uh, electricity, then the price uh, drops to zero or sometimes negative. Um, and then uh, we still have a lot of, so w we still have m most of the days of the year where we cannot supply not even half of the electricity from wind. Uh, on average last year, I think you all know it was 40%, um, but of course we are still building new wind parks, so eventually we will get above 50%, 60 and so forth. And, um, and this was a really good week. This is, these are two weeks from December last year where there was many days where we had 100% of the electricity um, from wind. 
Um, but one of the things I want you to notice is even when we provide 100% of electricity from wind, we still run the, what you see there in the background is the uh, coal-fired power plants and the gas-fired power plants and, and other power plants, uh, decentralized power plants. Um, so they still run when we have 100%. Uh, and that's because we need to keep the frequency in the network and the voltage and all that stuff. So, and, and also they have to be able, if the, s the wind suddenly drops, they have to be able to take over. So they cannot stand still. They have to be kind of idle to, to take over. So of course, in that situation, we export the e additional power we generate to other countries around, around us, and then the price drops to zero because maybe they don't need all that additional um, power. And uh, I assume that with, with all the enthusiasm in that there is in this country, we're probably going to keep on building wind power until we, u you know, on many days we supply 200% of the electricity we need from wind. And then, of course, we will try to sell all that uh, uh, surplus electricity to uh, Norway or Sweden. And Denmark is in, in a unique position in the world because we have Norway and Sweden, which act as a huge battery for us. You know, whenever we have too much, we can sell it to them. And, uh, oh yeah, put on the other slide. Last year, there was only 16 days where the price went negative. This is amazing. That battery we have there in neighbor countries worked really, really well. Uh, but I'm afraid that when we get to 200%, they will, well, there will be many days where it goes negative. So I assume that quite soon we will see a situation in Denmark where maybe 25% of the days of the year you have negative energy prices. Of course, that's good for you as a consumer, you, you would think. <laughs> um, because the Denmark is the country in the world where we pay the, the highest price for electricity. And it, it's, not, it's not the production of the electricity. That's cheap. And of course, as soon as we've built more windmills, that price would come down. But it's all the subsidies and all the complexity in the network. So you have, when you have this complex network where, where you have to power up and down all kinds of uh, power plants to equal out the frequency and the voltage, that becomes a very expensive uh, system to manage. And also you have to be able to tell Sweden that one minute we want to send you a lot of energy. Oh, stop, now we want to get a lot of energy from Sweden. So it's not even the daily system, it's also the <coughs> transmission systems to, to Sweden that, uh, and, and nowhere that has to be capable of handling all this uh, load following. And uh, of course we can do it, and there's a lot of engineering jobs in, in those uh, brown colors, so that's good for this group. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a little bit of a problem, the way we generate energy. Maybe, maybe it's not the smartest way, but I, I just need to tell you how things work. Um, for solar, now solar is not very big in Denmark, but we need to discuss that a little bit. Solar has other problems, but they're related. Uh, so when you have solar, of course, it's only during the day. And then you have this problem that most of the days of the year, it's cloudy. So you, then you have a cloud coming in front of the sun, and then it goes away, and then you have full power again. So you have these crazy curves where it goes full, you know, 100% power, and then drops to almost zero within a minute. And then a little bit later, it comes online again. So you need to design an electricity system that can keep the voltage and the frequency in a domain where you have lots of power that comes like this. <coughs> that is like really, really big challenge for, for engineers. Of course, it's no problem if like half a percent of your total grid network is supplied from solar. Of course, we can handle that. It's a big network. But when you start to see 20% or 50% solar, then it becomes like a huge challenge, much more difficult than thorium energy. Um, to handle that. Of course, the, the way to handle that is to put a huge battery right next to your solar plant. So you, you just put your power into the battery and then you can slowly unload the, the power from the battery. So it's basically you just need a, a huge low pass filter. Uh, but then the problem, so you have the solar cells that are coming down in price really <laughs> rapidly and we are all happy about that. But then you have the bat battery technology you also need, but it's not coming down in price. We have been researching for more than 100 years in storage capacity, and it's basically the best one in the world is Norway and Sweden. So, um, so th that is a difficult problem to solve, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we need some more engineers to, to look into that. Uh, okay, so uh, coming back to why we want to do thorium energy. Um, so a lot of uh, smart people have kind of said that this is the grand challenges that our generation are facing. Well, it was also the, the generation before that, but they couldn't solve it. But I actually believe that our generation have a chance of solving these problems. 
and uh, especially for the, the, the three problems over here, education, security, and healthcare, the main ingredients to solve those problems are information technology. And there has been a huge advantage uh, in, in information technology in the last 20 years, I'm sure you all know. Uh, and there are some really great companies and really, really good people working in that uh, field. And they're making progress. It feels like every month there's new progress. So I have a, a great hope that when we kind of give the world to the next generation, most of these problems will have been solved for the majority of the global population. And I think that's quite something that, uh, that I'm very positive about. But then the other problems over here, like we all want fresh drinking water and we all want healthy food and enough food. And we also want to uh, clean, a clean environment around us and not create too much stress, you know, having recycling and stuff. And if you want to solve those problems, the main ingredients you need is energy. It's not the only ingredients, but it is the main thing. Um, and uh, over there, I don't see any great companies that are making great progress or, um, or any governments or politicians that really say, this is, this is something we want to solve. Let's come on. Come on, people. Let's solve it. It's like nothing is happening. And I think, like you were saying, we need to make it a grassroots movement uh, and, and kind of disrupt that whole sector. Uh, it seems that the energy sector that we have built is broken in some way. And, and we have to rethink maybe there's a better way to, uh, to create energy. And we all, I think we all recognize that it's really, really important for us as humans on this planet. And more so when we become eight and nine billion people. So we are a group of uh, engineers and scientists here in Copenhagen who decided to start what we call Copenhagen Atomics, which is a a very small company where we work on these thorium energy and molten salt reactor technologies. Um, and we've, we try to set down um, four cornerstones of what is it really that we need to do. Well, first of all, to rethink the whole nuclear sector, we cannot produce these huge power plants where you hire 5,000 5, people who have never built a nuclear before, and then and, uh, managers and everything, who do, and then you put them on a huge learning curve with super uh, tight specs it becomes just a bad way of making power plants. We believe that if you want to produce this in a smart way, you, you produce it on an assembly line just like we do with cars and airplanes. And then we can easily produce them uh, very efficiently and get the price to come down and the quality to go up. Um, and then we also believe very strongly in rapid technology cycles. That's because the first airplane doesn't look like the the most, the most modern airplane we have today, or the first mobile phone certainly doesn't look like the iPhone you have in your pocket. And that's because with many, many technologies, it needs to improve through a long process where a lot of engineers have to be very um, innovative and improve the product. And we think molten salt reactor is exactly the same. We need to get started. We've, we already built the first one, obviously, but now we need to go through a process with quick iterations where we can improve the technology. And we have to build that into the way we think about this. We cannot make it like the old nuclear industry. It takes 10 years just to change a m a minor detail. Uh, th that won't work if we want to solve global energy problems. Um, and then uh, I think it's very important point. We need to solve the nuclear waste problem. Otherwise, the public will never accept a new era of nuclear. But the good news is that these waste burners can burn uh, the spent nuclear fuel, we already heard that before. Uh, so we can actually take all that spent fuel and use it for a good thing and burn it one more time and get a lot uh, less uh, problematic waste out of it. And finally, in Copenhagen Atomics, we believe strongly that uh, if we're going to do this new nuclear era, it needs to be uh, from collaboration between scientists and companies and between countries, and it, it needs to happen through openness. <coughs> So we really want to adopt that. And that's also part of the reason that we have uh, international speakers here, is because we want to we want to set up relationships and, and collaboration with these guys, because we know that this is very, really important if we want to move this forward. And in coming atomics, the things we are very strong on is chemistry, it's uh, measurement technologies, and it's control systems. Um, and these are the kind of things where we think we can really provide value to the global community for building molten salt reactors. And I want to invite all of you to come along and help us if you want to. We are an open organization, um, but of course, it's not a company where you get paid, at least not now. Uh, let, um, so uh, there was a question, what does this cost? And I get that question every time. And I agree with all the former speakers that it's 
very, very difficult to predict. And one of the main reasons it's difficult to predict is that this is mainly a poli pol political question. And you can, you know, you, we don't know what's going to be decided. Uh, but I want to say this, that this is one of the drawings that we make of what we would like to build. And there's a huge, co if you want to start this, build it and start it up, there's a huge cost in getting it approved so that you can be allowed to add fissile fuel and start it up. But let's for one second just put that aside and say, we don't, we don't want to talk about the approval cost. Then there are basically two costs left. One cost is the engineering, the R&D that goes into actually get this up and running. That is also very expensive. I mean, we will need many engineers and scientists for many years working on this. So let's put that cost aside. Then what do we have left? Then we have left uh, a box made out of metal. Inside the box, there are some pipes and pumps and valves and some tanks. And then there are some salt fu uh, fluids, which is basically just the chemical components. And uh, all those uh, things inside the box are already used other places in the industry. OK, yes, this, is th this needs to be high temperature steels. But we're already in using high temperature steels in, in other process industries and chemical industries. So, um, so we kind of know what's inside the box. And we have this dream in coping atomics that we want to build something, a non-fission prototype, where we can test many of, our, of the chemistry problems and, and measurement technologies. And we think that we can actually build what's inside the box uh, for something like $2 million. So it's not a huge amount. But then I'm forgetting all these costs that I put over here. This is just for the raw materials, right? Uh, and many of these things we can order from subcontractors. Uh, so, so there is actually a chance for a company like Codemaker and Summits to get started on this. Um, I will skip this slide because I'm almost out of time. Uh, so I'm the kind of guy who likes small actions that can have a huge impact on a lot of people. And the reason I put this picture up here, it's Sputnik. It was a small group of people uh, with a very limited budget that decided to put this ball into orbit around the, the planet. And it, it didn't do anything, and it, it only had a, a short lifespan of a few months. But boy, did it change the world. And I think you all know that. It changed the mindset of 100 million people. And I think we ought to do something similar with thorium energy. Um, I don't know exactly what it is we're going to do, um, but I'm trying to figure out. So I was also part of another team here in Copenhagen that many of you know, it's Copenhagen Suborbitals. Again, it's a group of people who said, oh, we want to have our own amateur space program. And uh, many people said, that's not possible. A space program costs a trillion dollars or something. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, we don't. We're going to work on it for free, and then we're going to just buy cheap materials, and then we're going to try to get people to sponsor some of the things that we cannot afford ourselves. And then many people shaking their heads and said, this is a crazy idea. But when they started to fly their rockets like 10 kilometers into, uh, into s not into space, but into the air, people said, oh, maybe this, this is something. Um, and they did that at a cost that was like 0 to 1% of the cost that a government would spend on the same thing. So I think something interesting is happening. Um, and one of the other things I want to point to is that for example, the biggest taxi company in the world doesn't have any vehicles. And the biggest hotel chain, hotel chain <laughs> in the world doesn't have any hotel rooms. And I think in the future, we will see that the biggest energy company in the world is not producing any energy. So the, the world is really changing. And um, with that, I want to thank and uh, open for questions.